Get the ultimate experience in cleanliness and comfort without breaking the bank when you transform your bathroom with Niagara. From toilets to bidets, Niagara has the perfect solution for any bathroom project. Niagara's award-winning products not only outperform the competitors, they also outdesign them. Thanks to innovations like stealth technology, Niagara's environmentally friendly products can use only half as much water as their competitors, conserving water and saving you money. And there's more great news for homeowners. You can now shop for Niagara products on Amazon or HomeDepot.com. Thank you, Niagara. Welcome to another week of sports talking, mostly Cowboys talking, with me, John Radigan, and my man, Nate Newton, who at some point in the very near future is going to lean close into the camera, and he's going to say Let the me phrase tell that you has something. become the no, title. Rad, you messed up my intro. You, you opened it just perfect and did what I was going, Rad. You broke it. Let me tell you something, I broke in. Something, I was Rad, just giving you that launch pad. Wow. You're going to lean into that camera and say what? Let me tell you something. Boy, I tell you, Rad, you special, boy. Man, you got to get back in the groove, baby. We missed last week and it threw us off. Wow, but hey, we got a lot to talk about. If we do, it's a lot to talk about because that Thanksgiving Day game, Nate, was in many ways almost perfect. I saw many quotes from Jerry, Mr. Jones, after the game saying, This was one of his happiest days as the Cowboys owner between winning big, uh, you know, against a rival, between the halftime show with Dolly Parton, between (laughs) setting an NFL record for the season when Deron Bland returned that pick stick. I mean, there was just so much to like about that game, Nate. You were there. What do you take away? Uh, Just just a lot of good things happened, man. Uh, I think it was their third win out of the six-game run that I think they have to have to be successful this season. And uh, I, I was I was proud of them. And, uh, you know, I'm glad Dolly got to uh, to, do, to do what the Miss Dolly do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the young people don't know Miss Dolly like we do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so yeah. Uh, it, it was just amazing for, to the young guys being in the studio, we watching the show, and they just looking at me. Waiting on my response. I'm like, hey, man, to me, she's an icon. To y'all, she's just an elderly lady. And I just shook my head because these young people, it's it's a great difference between, she was one of the first Taylor Swifts. Is that got that right? And and Miss Swift, she was was 20 years ago, she was that girl. As far as country singing. And making movies, and now, you know, the young people, you know, Miss Jones, I understand about fifty percent of these people is up under thirty years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, they, well, they they got introduced in a big way, and it was actually probably closer to forty years ago that she was <laughs> Miss Swift. But but I will say this: uh, I was stunned to see the uh, her coming out there in a Dallas Cowboys Bruh. cheerleader yeah. outfit. That Come one on. a nine to five. I'm telling you, nine. No, <laughs> one a nine to five. I, I just and that's no. what they. Oh, that's what the younger guys was looking at me like. What What is she doing? You know, she could be my mom or my grandma. And I'm like, I, I love Dolly Parton. I love the movies she made. I love the music she's made. And just sometimes, like football, rad when they tell us, you know, even a great Troy Aikman had to hang it up. <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah, sometimes we just have to hang it it up, man. You're calling it. Yeah, Yeah, she did kind of have to hang on to the star and all that stuff. Stop, man. Let's get off of this part, man. Keep her balance. She gave us her last performance, I think, in Texas Stadium. That was fantastic. Okay, so, uh, yeah, let's talk about that game. Uh, Highlight has to be Deron Bland. When you set an NFL season record for pick sixes, and there's six games left in the year, Nate. Yes, and the Cowboys have to win. They've won. Uh, they've won against two, three teams that they should have crushed. Right. Uh, they beat. This is the amazing thing. Let me just get to it. The amazing thing was uh, twenty-five points in the fourth quarter. 
Yeah. Th- what that told me about the Cowboys is the Cowboys had them 20 to 10. And at no point, none of us was thinking, oh, man, the Reds, excuse me, the Washington Commanders are in this game. At no point. And then all of a sudden, you know, they kept throwing the ball. And I say, sooner or later, these boys going to start getting a lot of heat on this kid. They're going to stop him. And he's going to make sure and throw an interception and the game going to flip. And then when the game flipped, man, it was a 25-point explosion. And uh, just Deron Bland has, uh, whether people want to admit it or not, he's now put himself in the uh, player of the year category. A couple of more interceptions, and he could easily be the defensive player of the year. Uh, you know, sacks are nice, but they don't equal to pick sixes. And, you know, I tell people interceptions may come off of uh, – pressures and sacks but I'm telling you this kid here is a cover a cover maniac he wasn't having the greatest a day up until that point either but they just mm-hmm. kept going at him and this guy has great anticipation and uh you know not Sam Howell along with uh Eric B enemy has that record forever you know yeah yeah so I, I, I so yeah uh- this is a guy, Nate, who, I mean, obviously, we were worried when Trayvon Diggs went down and we're like, well, well Deron Bland going to go in and do the best he can, I guess, next man up. But I'm telling you, I mean, not only has he done, you know, all that and then some, but he's clearly made himself, uh, first of all, he's made the Cowboys secondary that much stronger yeah. in the future, hasn't he? I mean, yes. he's earned himself a spot to be out there somewhere, even when Diggs is back. The thing about it, a year ago, two years ago, I tried to tell everybody in training camp, I said, y'all, I'm not trying to be funny. But this uh, Deron Bland kid should be starting, and they say over over J. Lou over over Lewis. I say I said I said you know what I want I want Lewis to play. I said but this kid, and they put him on the bench for a minute, was giving him spot play. What by the eighth ninth game of the season, Lewis got hurt. He came in, I led the team's in interception. Think about that now. He yeah. led the team in interception, four or five interceptions. They got him now. We go out and get Gilmore. Jay Lewis coming back. Uh, this kid is, uh, you know, they, you know, giving Jay Lou some time, and you know, not, you know, not exclusively giving this kid all the slot plays, you know. And all of a sudden, we lose Diggs. Now they put him out there, and the next thing you know, once again, this kid is leading the league in interceptions. He's leading the league in touchdowns for interceptions, which he leads the. The uh, guy's the, the record solely to himself. He's sitting right now in the Hall of Fame. If he never put on a gold jacket, yeah, he can tell his kids, yeah. "Let me go show you something special," you know. And so, this kid, uh, people, you know, people, you know, say, "Hey, we," you know, a lot of people saying we ain't giving him his his just due, you know. Uh, he, he, we don't have to. The world see it. I mean, they they see it, and uh, this kid is a good kid, a humble kid. Uh, who works hard, who listens to his coaches. Deron Bland, man, is just – I just think, man, next year, you know, he'll probably be an outside guy. We we have Lewis inside. We get we get our digs back. But you know what? I'm going to say this now because it's on my mind. I just hope Diggs come back. And I hope he come back maybe four or five or six or seven games into the season. I, I, I don't I, – I don't want a guy – I don't believe in just bringing a guy back in. He medically cleared. He just throw him out there. I saw it with uh, Michael Gallup, and it was, it, was, it was ugly for a whole year. I saw it with Ron – with Steele. It, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's been ugly, and we needed these stretcher games against these not-so-good teams so he could work on his technique and get himself back. People say, well, what's the difference, you know, uh, if you're a rookie or what is, what's the difference? The difference is when you're coming off an injury, a major injury like that, mentally you don't know where you're at. And I like to just ramp a guy up than to just throw a guy out there, you know, give him a chance to get it all together mentally and physically. So – I'm I'm praying that for Ty, for for Diggs, but hey, this thing is about Bland right now. He is the man. Yeah, and uh, so you mentioned Terrence Steele, and so we've talked about the defense, offense, Nate. As you well know, it's like a symphony, right? Yes, Everything sir. has to work together. Yes, sir. And and the offensive line is where it all starts. 
and it appears again against uh, you know somewhat lesser competition. But this offensive line seems to be having its best stretch of the season, perhaps not coincidentally, as Dak Prescott has his best stretch of the season. The thing is, this started with Dak. Please, people, let me tell you something. This <laughs> started with Dak moving around, using his legs, not for f- so much for first downs, but to avoid sacks. This last, the well, Panthers, Washington, who else we had? Was it New England we started with? Then uh, the Panthers, then Washington. Uh, I hope I got that Giants right. in there somewhere. Yeah, that's what New York Giants, Panthers, Washington. I don't know why I got, I got New York, New York up here, but New York Panthers and and, and Washington. Uh, we were fortunate enough that we uh, they got rid of Leonard, you know, and they sent him to Seattle, which we'll see him soon. But my my issue has always been this, and I've told people four years ago or three years ago when he hurt his ankle. I said, I know I understand it's going to take a moment to get his mindset back from that ankle. I said, but if Dak drops straight back and think he's uh, got that type of arm skill or that type of arm talent, I said, it's not going to work. Dak has to move around, rollouts, uh, just him being aware of what's in the pocket and, make, and making that subtle move to the right or that subtle move to the left. Uh, running out to to his uh, left or right six or seven yards just to give his receivers a second chance to reopen themselves up. And he's finally started doing it uh, about four or five games ago. I think it started with the uh, with the Denver uh, – excuse me, I'm talking about Denver. It started – ooh, I'm got, I can't remember the game. But anyway, it started about four or five games ago. The 49ers game, he started moving around. And uh, – and it's been it's been just nice ever since. It's been and so this brings me back to what your original stuff is the offensive line. Now what you have in your offensive line, now with Tony Pollard, man, who is really I mean, this dude is picking up blocks. He knows the scheme. He understands where how to protect, how to help guys. He don't run past the quick escape guys. Like if a guy get beat quick, quick, instead of him getting out in his route, he'll he'll hit that guy. He'll stop that guy and then go out into his route. So it uh sacks and pressures, that's a team thing. That's a whole that's that's your quarterback. That's your that's your old line. That's your running backs, and on the hot routes, that's your receivers working. So, because the longer you go without a sack, the longer you go without a pressure in a game, that's demoralizing to a defense. <clears throat> And and that offensive line has been providing that, certainly. Now, I wonder from uh, that game on on Thursday, normally, Nate, what you have in your whole career, what you had after that was pretty much 10 days off. Yes. Of course, the Cowboys play Thursday again this week against the Seahawks. I know it's the same amount of time between games. Does that does that affect them? Does that bother them? Is that a is that a ten day break you really look forward to after you know such a difficult turnaround between Sunday to Thursday? Back in the day, it was. I mean, because you it was only you in Detroit that was getting this luxury, so it was an advantage. Now it's not an advantage. Some teams get two or three of those, you know, depending on who they are and how great they're playing. So. Uh, they'll get this 10-day break after this game, and uh, and, and they should be all right. Coach McCarthy started about a month ago, giving guys time to rest their legs. They started with Tyron Smith and trying to give him one day a week of practice and uh, just uh, letting him go through the walkthroughs. And so he he's prepared for this. And uh, this is where we will see if it pay off against the Seahawks. This is where all of this uh, – Time off, the mental work. These guys have done a great job. I'm one of those guys that you win, you win, you win, and you build confidence and you build confidence so you don't think anyone can beat you. So when you come up against a tough opponent or you have some adversity in the game, you can play right through that adversity, man, because you, you know, you know, and, and you can just feel good about who you are and what you're doing. And so by beating New York and the Panthers, uh, and in Washington, you got a chance to fix a lot of those small chinks in the armor. We still got to try to get rid of those uh, 
offsides, uh, illegal formations, and the, the holdings. We get rid of we get rid of one or two of those things. I mean, stuff like that happened during the game, but you don't need two or three of them. You don't need them to multiply because the better teams, starting with Seahawks, they gon' they gon' they can capitalize. Washington, they couldn't capitalize. The Panthers, yeah. you see, they're not fired. They hold coaching staff. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, and I knew this was coming because somebody got in the owner's ear and said, "Hey, man, this is how you're gonna treat your first round pick. You're just gonna let him drop back fifty times a game and get him beat to death." You'll be in line for another quarterback in two years because the kid yeah. is gonna got beat to death. And the same with Sam Howell. Uh, I love Eric Bieniemy to death, but there's no way in the world it's, I'm only down by ten, and I'm gonna let the Cowboys rush my guy. I'm not going to do that. But anyway, that's not my teams. Those are not my teams. And you know, uh, just you know, get in that. You know, the Taylor quarterback, Big Noon, said, "Hey, let me tell you something, bro. Get, get in that whirlpool." <laughs> Get in that ice chamber, bro. That's all I can tell you. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that, that, you know, the Houston Texans way back in the day, they did that to David Carr. Same thing. Yeah. Every poor young man could have had a great career, got beat up so bad his first two, he couldn't really, probably never lived up to what he could have been. Now, uh, you talked about owners. Right. So let's go to the Cowboys owner mm. who made a big announcement that we have not had a chance to talk about yet. Your coach, Jimmy Johnson, finally is going into the ring of honor. You know, my brother, I am so excited about that. I am uh, over the top. Uh, when two big uh, alpha males can come together and make things, something like that happen, man. I mean, uh, and for Jimmy to say, you know, back in the day, you know, Jimmy probably, ah, yeah, if I get in, I get, no, no, no. Some things ain't about that old nonchalant cocky attitude it's like you deserve yeah. to be in there i'm glad you're in there i'm glad mr jones put him in there two great men uh who had great impacts on my life and still have an impact on my life i like to know that they they have hearts just like we do that they're human just like we do that they can work through situations man just like just like me and rad when we get into it with the wife you know something we mean me and you <laughs> calm down and we go at it from a different angle and we calm down and we and, th and that's what these two men did they just they calmed themselves they met and they said okay let we can make it happen and they made it happen and i'm i'm excited i'm gonna be there bro uh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be there for that one too. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Nate. Uh, because you are uh, out there so much and you talk about this team, and everybody loves to get your opinion about this team, I'm sure you were asked this, you know, over the past 10 years or more. You know, hey, do you think Jimmy's ever going to get in? What What was your answer uh, prior to this? Did uh, Did you really think this day would come? No, I, I told him, I say that's up to Mr. Jones. That's 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 uh, his call. I say I wish for the players' sake that they would talk, and I wish that they would uh, come together. You you all, you 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 were the owner, so you had many great players up under your uh, you working for you. You were the head coach. You won many Super Bowls up under this owner, and I'm like, wow. You you mean to tell me two men who can handle the type of characters that we had on our squads and still to this day can't get past their own little problems. And that used to be my thing. I would tell it everybody that I knew that was sincere, you know, about when they asked me that question, like, I know you are sincere, you know, and you're not just trying to fish for some old high side story to make yourself look good. And that's what I would tell the people. I, I thought that was really concerned about whether coach Johnson would get in. I, I was like saying to myself, man, I hope coach Johnson ain't, you know, no longer with us. I ain't no longer with us when this day come, you know, because that's one of my biggest things about the Hall of Fame. You know, you, you, you know, guy been out there for 45 years and you just letting him in and now he can't even talk or he can't and he's not alive. And, and you, you know, you should get points taken away from you for that. But I'm glad. So now, uh, Think back on, you know, and Jimmy Johnson is a very complex character. You know, he's mm. one of those onions, right? Right. Where you could just peel layers and layers and layers off right. of that man. What What do you think, if you could say this, Nate, what, it, what was his best characteristic as a coach? For me, yes. he knew his players. 
He knew his players. He knew who to push, who not to push. Uh, if he if he held a grudge, you could not tell. That that's what that's what amazed me about him and Coach him and Mr. Jones. I'm like, Jimmy always did it for the sake of winning. You always knew he'll come at you hard. He'll say things, but it was always in the sake of winning. It was never personal, you know. Uh, because if Jimmy didn't like you, he would really just get rid of you. You know, if he personally yeah. didn't like you, he would just get rid of you. And so. Uh, if he thought you could help this team uh, win or you could contribute to this team, he tried to find out what, what your likes was, what your dislikes was. And each, and he, and uh, he had, you know, he, he knew his players, man. And that's what I liked about it. That, you know, that's what I admired about coach Jay. Which means he treated everybody a little bit differently. A lot based different on, depending on where you was yeah, on the so, scale. Because the scale was up, yeah, the scale yeah. was up in it, it was scale down here. I was somewhere in there. <laughs> okay. So how how did he treat you? What was his m- method of of getting through to Nate? Do you, what do you think that was? I, I, he let me be me. Once I understood that it was about winning first, it was about winning second, it was about winning third. Once and knowing when to work, I had to realize because I could take any situation, no matter how hard it is, uh, uh, you know, and I could crack a joke or I could laugh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and I had to realize sometimes it wasn't about cracking a joke or making somebody laugh. It's about going to work and concentrating on the task at hand. And once I learned that right there, I kind of could look at Jimmy and, and read him. And, and I said, oh, I can have me some fun today, Coach Johnson. All right, uh, not today. You know, it's <laughs> it's time to go to work. And three Super Bowls later, six Pro Bowls, two All Pros, still working for the Cowboys. I still carry that in my heart now. No, no when to work and no when to play and no when you can mix two of them together. You know, and that's what Jimmy let me be that guy. He He let me. Be Nate, I promise you. I remember you walking up and down the the aisle of the plane, the team charter. Yes. After wins, not after losses. Not after. Nobody was talking much after <laughs> losses, after wins. And you would just mess with everybody. Yeah. You know, here comes Brad Sham. You got a little comment for him. Here's me. You got a comment for me. You know, everybody along the plane and then you'd get to your players and you that was behind us. Right. So I didn't hear all that, but I knew you had one for all of them. Uh, th- I think people today, because they see you on TV so often and so forth, um, there's no time to really show the real Nate. But man, you were as fun-loving and as jovial, like the class clown, as anybody on that team. And and uh, I know that's still part of your personality, Nate. But uh, uh, you, that was that was something that I would think uh, the other players embraced as well. Yes. Yeah. You know, it was Tuane, myself, uh, Kevin Gogan. Uh, you know, Tuane was quiet about his joking yeah. and stuff, and uh, Kevin was a little more. A little more like me, you know, boisterous, but not as loud, you know. Uh, It's just, uh, I'm telling you, it's just for Jimmy, and that's when I learned, he, Jimmy was an X and O guy, especially defensively. He was an X and O guy, especially defensively. But uh, what makes great coaches and I'm telling you, what's made great coach like the coach in the, with the Pittsburgh, the coach that is coaching the Pittsburgh Steelers, how in the world mm-hmm. are they six and whatever, or seven and whatever? Because yeah. they playing for that coach. They playing for themselves, but they playing for that coach. And Jimmy had a knack, just like Phil Sims had a knack. You know, just like the coach down in my, with the Miami Heat. Everybody don't have this knack to be able to touch players, to talk to players. Uh, to love on players, but automatically still have the respect when it's time to go to work. And Jimmy just had that that specialty about him, man. He, you know, um, he, he was the man. The uh, that Mike Tomlin, who you referenced there, uh, the Athletic just did uh, uh, 
what's anonymous survey of NFL players today. And they said, if you couldn't play, if you weren't playing for the coach you play for, who would be your first choice? And like a huge percentage, 30 or 40 percent of them said Mike Tomlin. He was by far the winner of that. What, what is it from afar that makes people think he's so good, Nate? It's just uh, when, 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 you, when players believe you care, you actually care, and you're straight up with them, whether they finna get released or whether they finna make the team or whether they're going through some problems emotionally, spiritually, or physically, he is that guy. You can go to him and say, Coach, this is my situation. How can we uh, get it resolved? And he'll try to find a way. Or, you know, if you're on the field not doing your job, he's going to hold you accountable uh, to what you need to do, you know. But by the same token, he'll be that first guy to pat you on the butt when you do do that job that they ask you to do, you know, and be the first one to just, uh, uh, you know, get at you, you know, uh, talk to you or scold, scold you, whatever the words you want to use but that, that falls upon the umbrella of discipline. The, the, the thing is when, when players see you and hear you and you don't waver every day, you know, you don't have to be the meanest guy in the world every day. You don't have to be the laughing this guy every day, but you have to have a, the happy medium where, fellas, it's time to go to work, it's time to have fun, uh, it's time to whatever. And, and and that's, you know, it's kind of hard to explain because it's just, it's a unique deal. And every coach does not have it. They try, and, but they be phony, and you can see it, you know. And you be like, man, this dude ain't, you know, this dude ain't. Uh, uh, and his assistants are guys that yeah. – gets his message across. That that's the, that's another thing. Jimmy had loyal assistants. Yeah. Bill Sims had loyal assistants. Still as coach, Mike Tomlin have loyal assistants. You know, everybody's on the same page. When they leave up out of that meeting room, with the coaches meeting room, everybody you may not think, you may not like, but we're gonna speak the same the same talk and the same words when you leave this meeting. That's what it's all you're about. Such a fo- you're such a football guy. You don't mean Phil Sims. You mean Phil Jackson. Yeah, Phil Jackson. Excuse me. <laughs> Lord, you, you let me go eight times on Phil I, Sims. I and hey, no, no. You only said it twice. The first time you said it, my brain's going, Phil Sims? Yeah. The heck does Phil he mean Sims, Phil Sims? He was disciplined too, but he wasn't a great athlete. When you, said it, when you said it the second time, I'm like, he means Phil Jackson. Phil okay. Jackson, yeah. man. Yeah, the, the great the guru, Bulls coach. Man. Phil Jackson was a master of uh, dealing yes. with talent and dealing with different uh, attitudes. Thank you. Thank you. It's, I guess it's that ugly blue uniform you got on there, that was Giants color. Yeah, yeah. I ain't got that wrong. That's why I, I tripped you up. This is Lions, man. Honolulu <laughs> blue and silver right here, baby. Oh, now you're jumping back across the stream. Wow. Way to go. Yeah, I'll go both ways. <laughs> uh, I, I'll tell you this, and that's the game, uh, that Lions game is the one where Jimmy gets inducted, uh, and, um, you know, that's uh, that's going to be a that's going to be a battle. Here's the thing, Nate. We got to talk about this real quick because people, as soon as the Cowboys, um, you know, got to this stretch, uh, you know, at the they were right at the beginning of this stretch, and everybody said, "Well, Cowboys' schedule gets easy, and look how tough Philadelphia is, and we're going to count on Philadelphia losing two or three of those." Guess what, Nate? And you said it at the time. You said, don't count on that. And they haven't lost, Nate. To to this day, I still listen to all of our shows. Now it went from Philadelphia could be two and two, you know, because their stretch was uh, bye week, Casey, Buffalo, San Francisco now. And they have beaten Casey. They have beaten Buffalo. Now they got San Francisco and what what if they beat San Francisco? Right. That means the Cowboys cannot lose. And that's why I've told everybody the Cowboys have to win six games. And this is going to be their toughest game right here. This Seattle Seahawks game is going to be a monster, a beast of a game. And people say, why do you think that? Because it's a NFC game, number one. I respect the coach. Pete Carroll, with the utmost respect, their quarterback is trying to be the best he can. They got two hellacious receivers, man, and Lockett and DK Metcalf. They got a running back, uh, this Walker kid. 
a decent offensive line. They got a nice defense. Uh, Adams, Bobby Wagner. Uh, they went out and got um, Leonard Williams. So they, they, they are six and five. The Cowboys are physical and smart. They'll be six and six. But if the Cowboys can't be physical and smart, that's that. You have athletes that match their athletes. They have athletes that match your athletes. We're going to be tested in our secondary like you wouldn't believe. Our defensive line is going to be tested in the run game like you wouldn't believe. You know, and defensively, so, I mean, they, they got some ballers, man. Uh, they went out and drafted yeah. the kid. I can't even think of his name. They went out and drafted a, a, a nice kid, man. Uh, I'm, I'm going to look him up right quick like Rad. Bear with me. Bear with me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they – yeah, that they you talk about that physicality that the Cowboys need to bring, yes. and I want to get back to physicality. Who who you got? Devon Witherspoon. There you go. So, do he a ball or not? Yeah, they got to six and five. Yeah, because they faced the 49ers last week, who, as we know, right. are as physical as any team in the NFL. And look, the 49ers kind of treated them as they treated the Cowboys, right? They they beat up on the Seahawks pretty good last Thursday night. So, uh, you know, can the Cowboys, will the Cowboys borrow a page from the 49ers and bring that kind of effort, that kind of physicality to this game? Yeah, the, the thing... I tell people, man, it's hard to be athletically fast and quick and and scheming. But what happens when somebody grabs you around your collar and squeezes it up, squeeze up to your throat? What you gonna do then? You know, ain't no, you know, you can go ha ha ha, hit shot, but they still got you. You got to get up under his throat and start ch- choking him off. And that, and I'm what I'm. It's an ugly analogy, but yeah. you got to let him know that you ready, you you willing to. Be choked off, you know, let's see who lasts long. So I'm trying to choke you off too. I ain't trying to go around the back door. I ain't trying to chop your hands down. I'm I'm we're gonna see who can hold their breath the longest or who can last the longest. And that's 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 simply that. You know, I'm gonna punch you in your face, you punch me in mine. And at the end of the day, because they have equal a- athletes to us. The f- these 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 Seahawks have equal or better athletes than us. They What's going to come down to is who, what coach make what move and who, what players decide to execute in the most physical and the most violent way. And this is what this stretch for the Cowboys is going to be all about. This is what this stretch, the Seahawks, Philadelphia, Buffalo, Miami, Detroit, and then back again to Washington. Are you going to be physical the next four or five games and come out of this thing unscathed? Now I'm talking about unscathed for us record-wise. You may get beat up. You may have a couple of injuries, but you need to win these games. Don't worry about Philadelphia. I've always I tried to tell the people this for six, four weeks. Don't worry about Philadelphia. Worry about the Dallas Cowboys. Can they get a physical brand of football going? So, last thing, uh, we we hear that Mark Cuban has sold or you know they has executed an agreement uh, to sell it's got to be approved by the NBA owners executed agreement 3.5 billion dollars he will get from a, a, a woman who's the heir of a casino the Sands Casino in uh, in in Vegas and all over the world but you know it starts yeah. in Vegas anyway 3.5 billion so he sells you know essentially three quarters of it or more to another family he'll maintain control and operate the organization the Mavericks as he's done. Done. And I guess the question would be, because we always thought once Cuban bought the team in the year 2000 after becoming an instant overnight billionaire, we thought he ran this thing like Jerry Jones runs the Cowboys, right? right. Do you ever see Jerry doing like Mark Cuban? It won't be for three point five billion. It'll be for ten no, point no, five for, billion. Yeah, it'll be for a lot more now. Yeah, it'd be a lot yeah. more now. Uh, I, t- I, you know. I, 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 you know what? At the end of the day, it's about the money. Oh, at the end of the day, it's about the finances. Uh, he saw a way that he can make a lot of money and still keep control of his team. Uh, how long he would keep control of that team, we will see. 
Yeah. Because if you give up more than half, if you give up 51%, it's, it's always a chance for somebody to override you. Yeah. Even Mr. Jones told his kids, I love y'all to death, but me and Gene got 51%. Y'all got yeah. 49. We yeah. got that yeah. one point. And I, he, he got to write up a hell of a contract. A hell of yeah. a contract. And for the NBA to be get ready to, uh, oh, you know what the catch is? You know what the catch tell is? Me. Let me. me tell y'all something. In the NFL, <laughs> in the NFL, you can't be an owner of a gambling, gambling establishment or be connected and run that team. You have to sell your, your interest of the team. You can keep what you got. And yeah, Cuban pretty smart. Cause the yeah, NBA thinking like that, like you, this lady can never run. She's a she's a gambling entity, so you she can't actually, never run the, it. Um, actually, not not the same rule in the NBA because the Houston Rockets are owned by Tillman Fertitta, right. and he owns he owns a couple. He has full oh, ownership okay. of a couple of casinos. Oh, okay. Well, it, it, so, it, okay. Yeah, well, so back the to my NBA original is a, a little different that way, but but you're right. I mean, that's that was a consideration for sure. That, hey, and, back uh, to my original thought, you know, because power wants power, and I don't care what no one says. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, and I, and I've always believed that I, it has never failed me. When I see a guy, a young lady that's in power, and that power is threatened, uh, they do not lay down for it. So. If, if Coach, if, if I'm thinking calling Coach Cuban, if Mark Cuban, Mr. Cuban, I like to call people that power, Mr. If Mr. Cuban can be owning it, can be running this thing four years from now, I mean, you still doing, let me tell you something. I'm like, oh, yeah. Rad, that's pretty slick. But I, yeah. I just figured by four years, he'll be out of this thing. Uh, 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 they'll be chugging at, tugging at him pretty hard, you know, because everybody ain't going to like every move that you make. No. You know, no, so. she's going to have some grandchild who yeah. gets of age and goes, who's this old dude trying to look young running our team? Yeah, get rid of him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Give him another bill and get him out of there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, Man. Uh, Fantastic as always, Nate. We always enjoy doing this. And, of course, my favorite part of the show is every week when you look at the camera and you say the title of the show. Yes, sir. Let me tell you something. Thank you, Niagara, for letting us flush another one. <laughs> we appreciate it. Appreciate you, bro. 